So a whole lot of science is done. Are we finished with the science? Uh, not at all. The climate models we have today will undoubtedly be replaced with newer and better climate models tomorrow and 10 years from now. Just as the nightly weather forecast that you see and plan what you're going to wear tomorrow is much better than it was 10 or 20 years ago because the daily weather maps and the models that produce and predict those maps uh, have improved during the interval. So there's no question there is science that remains to be done. Uh, but I would argue that it is well past the point of time when we ought to be taking some action on this uh, feverish patient, namely our planet, uh, and move forth with some policies. I feel so strongly that that science is done that I want to spend most of my time tonight talking about some of the impacts on climate that we might expect. I'm going to skip over a few early slides here that I basically uh, have told you about already and move right to some uh, pictures of impact. This is one of several models of what the world's climate will look like uh, in slightly more than a decade from now, the decade 2020 to 2030 compared to today. Areas that are predicted to be warmer than the present are shown here in increasing browns, uh, orangish browns, up to two degrees centigrade or four degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today. And you see a broad swath of that warming predicted for Canada, Alaska, uh, Scandinavia, and, uh, and Russia. You also see an onset of warming down in high southern latitudes. There's a variety of models out there. They differ degree, and they, you can look in, and see individual differences uh, between them. But for the most part, they all show the same general pattern, and they show a magnitude of warming uh, that is relatively similar. Notice that the warming is seldom uh, predicted and very little seen along the equator here. Uh, it's seen at these high latitudes. Here's North America, South America, Africa, Australia. What kind of impacts can we expect this to have? When we look at, uh, for instance, uh, Antarctica uh, and the Antarctic ice sheet, where there's, of course, penguins, uh, we've seen huge breakups of some of these ice shelves. Uh, this is the Larsen B ice sheet in early 2002, January 2002. Uh, take a look at that mountain for perspective. Here it is in the second shot, which was taken just a couple of months later. An enormous ice sheet, something between the size of Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, breaking off, falling into the ocean, forming thousands of fragmented icebergs. And of course, just as you add ice to a glass of water, uh, that water will, uh, that glass will overflow. Uh, and of course, the, the equivalent of that is sea level rise. Uh, on planet Earth. We have some index of sea level rise already. This is a tide gauge record for Baltimore, Maryland. I don't know who told the harbor master to go out there in 1900 and start measuring it, uh, but it's a wonderful record that shows that sea level's been rising, but the rate of rise has roughly gone up by a factor of four uh, in recent decades. I'd say that something about sea level that's already telling us that the heat is on uh, on planet Earth. This is a map put together by Ben Poulter of the School of Environment at Duke a few years ago, uh, who looked at the outer banks of North Carolina. So here's Cape Hatteras and uh, the outer banks in eastern North Carolina, and mapped in blue, uh, in dark blue and light blue, the area of eastern North Carolina that would be flooded by not the extreme, but the average prediction of sea level rise uh, by mid and uh, later in this century. Uh, you can see vast areas here of eastern North Carolina that are underwater, including all of the outer, outer banks. Uh, I would strongly say that if your family has a tradition of vacationing or whatever on the outer banks, uh, don't plan necessarily on your kids inheriting that beach house. Uh, and if you're thinking of buying a beach house, I'd think twice about it if you want it as a long-term investment. Uh, the, lots of those areas, lots of our coastal areas, uh, are deemed to be flooded. Uh, we can look, I have a similar picture of New York City that shows flooding down in Wall Street. Now, given what's gone on on Wall Street, you may think that might be a good fate for them. Uh, but uh, uh, the impact on urban areas and the bills of the taxpayer uh, that will be expected uh, to be paid to save or uh, otherwise relocate those urban areas is sure to be large. Uh, this is a picture showing drought in the United States, recorded drought 
since 1900, or actually for the 100 years, 1900 to the year 2000. Areas that got drier over that interval are shown in red, uh, red triangles. Areas that got wetter shown in blue triangles. Uh, most of the eastern U.S. is predicted to get uh, somewhat wetter. And I'd only encourage you to say that's, that's the recent record of real climate uh, data for rainfall. Uh, this is a model prediction for the future, again, showing areas that get drier are shown in uh, reds, oranges, and increasing brown, areas that are predicted to get wetter in various shades of blue and purple. And you see a further onset of that southwestern drought, a further persistence of slightly wetter conditions uh, in the eastern U.S. Uh, you also see major droughts through here, uh, Central Europe and the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the drought in the central plains of the U.S. should be of enormous concern to every citizen of this planet in terms of the price of food, uh, the, the corn crop, the wheat crop, uh, that will be reflected in Kroger's and Harris Teeter and every time uh, one goes and buys a loaf of bread or buys uh, meat, beef, that has been fed uh, corn. Uh, our impact or the impact of climate just on the, on the lower 48 will be ramified throughout the world in terms of food prices. This is a map of the distribution of the corn borer uh, today in the United States showing an increasing shades of reddish brown areas that can expect to get attacked in any particular year up to the darkest shade of brown which means that 24 years out of 24 you can expect this uh, pest of the corn crop and a map on the right here that shows the anticipated distribution of that uh, corn pest uh, later in this century. And you see that it's moved consistently and uh, quite dramatically up through Iowa and Illinois and other areas uh, that are the central focus of our corn crop. And so not only can we expect drought to affect our food supply, but the impact on climate and the determin determinant that climate plays in the distribution of pests and insects uh, is certain to play out across this country and across the shelves of every grocery store. This is a map showing in areas of green, areas that are presently not suitable for malaria that are anticipated to become suitable uh, by the middle of this century. And those of you in the front, the rest of you will have to trust me, will see that along the, the Gulf Coast and the eastern coast of the U.S. here, Areas that today do not harbor malaria. If you walked into an emergency room with malaria type features, uh, the attendants there might not even have that on their radar screen of things to think about. Uh, but areas in which the distribution of malaria may become a commonplace uh, phenomenon. Uh, so not only are we thinking about pests for crops, but we're thinking about diseases uh, that may affect uh, humans directly. I was trained early on as a plant ecologist interested in soil chemistry and the distribution of things relative to climate. And this is one of my favorite slides of impact uh, because it shows in the top half of this graph the distribution of forest trees in the eastern United States today. You can really look at the red, the green, and the blue down here. Those are the important ones to notice. The red is beech maple forest. I had grown up in Cleveland, so I have a particular fondness for maple syrup and maple sugar candy, uh, but uh, it extends throughout the Midwest and up here in New England. The green is essentially the oak hickory forest that is characteristic and dominant over so much of the Smoky Mountains, and the blue is essentially uh, one or more of the southern pine forests that are planted so widely down in the coastal plain of the east and gulf coasts of the U.S. Bottom slide here is the distribution of forests anticipated in the year 2060, merely with the change in anticipated temperature alone. So the logic goes, trees are distributed according to temperature today. The physiology of trees uh, fixed today evolutionarily is likely to persist in uh, the short period of time. Therefore, trees will, be, will, will essentially differ in their distribution uh, in the future. You'll notice that beech and maple are totally lost in New England and the mid Midwest. Uh, in the lower 48, uh, they're likely to be found only out in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, the blue, the southern pines here, uh, have uh, no longer dominate the forests of the coastal plain. Uh, you'd find those as dominant forest dominance out in Louisiana, Missouri, Arkansas. Uh, and the eastern U.S. is predicted widely to be covered by an oak hickory savanna. 